Vladimir Putin. Part 3. We now turn to a selection of anecdotes and reports about Vladimir Putin to give us more insight into who he is and what we can determine from his behaviours as we continue to endeavour to form the lens through which all his activity, behaviours and actions can be gauged. First, we turn to a bug by Russian journalist Masha Gessen, the man without a face, who recounts the incidents whereby it was suggested that Vladimir Putin stole a ring from Robert Kraft. Gessen describes it thus. Several times, at least one of them embarrassingly public, Portin has acted like a person afflicted with kleptomania. In June 2005, while hosting a group of American businessmen in St. Petersburg, Portin pocketed the 124 diamond super Earl ring of New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft. He had asked to see it, tried it on, allegedly said, I could kill someone with this, then stuck it in his pocket and left the room abruptly. After a flurry of articles in the US press, Kraft announced a few days later that the ring had been a gift, preventing an uncomfortable situation from spiralling out of control. That isn't the only time that Putin has been accused of petty theft. The book goes on to describe another, even more brazen moment, where Putin allegedly had his bodyguards steal a glass Kalashnikov filled with vodka from the Guggenheim. In September 2005, Putin was a guest at New York's Guggenheim Museum. At one point, his host brought out a conversation piece. Another Russian guest must have given the museum. A glass replica of a Kalashnikov automatic weapon filled with vodka. The gaudy souvenir cost $300 in Moscow. Putin nodded to one of his bodyguards, who took the glass Kalashnikov and carried it out of the room, leaving the host speechless. Gerson goes on to argue that Portin actually su doesn't suffer from kleptomania, but the more obscure pleonexia, namely the insatiable desire to have what rightfully belongs to others. <clears throat> what about the suggestion, then, that this is a manifestation of kleptomania? Well, first of all, we must ask the question, what is kleptomania? According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 4th edition, the following symptoms and characteristics are the diagnostic criteria for kleptomania. Number one, a repeated inability to defend against urges to steal things that are not essential for private use for their economic value. Two, escalating sense of pressure immediately prior to performing the theft. Three, satisfaction, fulfillment or relief at the point of performing the theft. Four, the theft is not executed to convey antagonism or revenge and is not in reaction to a delusion or a fantasy. And five, the thieving is not better accounted for by a behaviour disorder, a manic episode or antisocial personality disorder. Let's have a look at those as a consequence of the behaviours that have been broken down. Is there a repeated inability to defend against urges to steal things that are not essential for provided use or for their economic value. I would suggest that there is an ability to defend against this, although we have two instances there of the appropriation of assets of other people. It's not something that's habitual. Porton is not an habitual shoplifter. He's not somebody that, when he's invited round to your house, you suddenly realise that one of your art pieces has gone missing, that he's pocketed or transited. And therefore, I would suggest that criteria, criterion one is not applicable. Is there an escalating sense of pressure immediately prior to performing the theft? Portin is not an individual that demonstrates any noticeable facial or behavioural or body language activity that suggests that he's experiencing a sense of pressure beforehand. He invariably looks fairly implacable, often difficult to interpret what's going through his mind, and certainly doesn't appear to be experiencing any pressure. Therefore, criterion two is not applicable. Is there satisfaction, fulfilment or relief at the point of performing the theft? Wouldn't say that there's relief exhibited. Doubtedly, there is satisfaction. 
Four, the theft is not executed to convey antagonism or revenge and is not in reaction to a delusion or a fantasy. I would suggest that it is executed to convey antagonism because it's part of an assertion of control. Five, the thieving is not better for or accounted for by behaviour disorder, a manic episode or antisocial personality disorder. I would suggest that it's more likely that his behaviours are potentially linked to antisocial personality disorder. And therefore, a finding of kleptomania is not appropriate. What then of Gesson's suggestion that is pleonexia, namely the insatiable desire to have what rightfully belongs to others? It's clear that that is applicable, but it is a part of a much wider form of behaviour that is exhibited by Putin. There is little doubt that he has an insatiable desire to have what rightfully belongs to others. Witness the two examples that have been mentioned earlier in this video. His annexation of Crimea, the recent invasion of the Ukraine, the war in Chechnya, the land grab of assets and resources that took place in the 1990s, the way that his supposed vast wealth and how that has been acquired. This desire, however, is demonstrative of his need to dominate through asserting control over others demonstrates an absence of remorse. It demonstrates a lack of boundary recognition. It is redolent of the manipulation of asset appropriation, which also is a lack of boundary recognition. There's a lack of accountability for the behaviours. There's a huge sense of entitlement. There's grandiosity to behave in such a manner. The haughty rejection of the rights of others and the entitlements of other people. And fundamentally, these are rather obvious behaviours. There's little subtlety involved. There's no sleight of hand or waiting until everybody's looking the other way before this misappropriation has occurred. It's brazen. The lack of subtlety. Is this perhaps because he's unaware of how his behaviour looks? Or is it that he knows full well what he's doing but regards him as so powerful and untouchable that he behaves in such a brazen way regarding subterfuge as almost a weakness, and he revels in such bold, direct, confrontational conduct, and the lack of attempt to restrain him thus entertains him, and underlines, at least in his mind, his hegemonic domination of his environment and those within it. That remains to be seen, and there'll be a determination of what's actually going on through the ongoing analysis. But it does demonstrate a variety of behaviours that support a disordered individual. In Gesson's book, she also describes how in 1991, Portin, then deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, allegedly organised a number of scams involving meat imports into the poor, starving city. This drive is believed by many to have enabled Portin to make himself fabulously wealthy, with reports of his wealth ranging from $40 billion to an incredible $70 billion. This supports a sense of entitlement, a lack of emotional empathy, a lack of accountability, asset appropriation, residual benefit, and manipulation. The absence of punctuality. Patience may well be a virtue, but few people would keep the Pope waiting. Vladimir Putin is an exception, however, with the Russian president showing up an hour late to a meeting in the Vatican with the Pope. Putin's tardiness is legendary, with journalists working in the Kremlin pool detailing regular waits of several hours as meetings rarely start on time. His lateness varies from leader to leader, and in Portin's terms, an hour's wait is almost a sign of respect. He was 50 minutes late for his first meeting with Pope Francis in 2013. Ukraine's ousted president, Viktor Yanukovych, once was, wait, came, was once kept waiting for four hours, while European leaders regularly report a wait of an hour or more. The lateness goes back to the early days of Putin's presidency. He was 14 minutes late for the Queen in 2003, and a year earlier kept parents of children killed in a plane crash waiting at a cemetery for two hours. In 2012, Putin was three hours late for a meeting with John Kerry in Moscow, leaving the US Secretary of State to take a walk in Red Square and twiddle his thumbs before the green light came from the Kremlin. There are no known cases of leaders simply giving up rather than sticking it out. Given that Putin manages to make it on time to televised press conferences and set-piece events, 
the general assumption, is that his tardiness when meeting with Russian and international politicians is a calibrated psychological policy. But being late is something that Putin has done for a long time. His former wife, Lyudmila Putina, once recounted how his lateness to their first dates reduced her to tears. I was never late, she said, but Vladimir Vladimirovich always was. An hour and a half was normal. I remember standing around in the metro. The first 15 minutes of lateness are okay, half an hour also fine, but when an hour goes by and he's still not there, you start crying. Repeated examples of an absence of punctuality when dealing with an intimate partner, when dealing with non-intimate secondary sources, world leaders, the Pope, non-intimate tertiary sources, journalists. What's behind all of that? Well, one explanation is he's a leader and therefore has many demands upon his time and he's governing a country and just because he has a meeting with somebody at 10am something could occur which requires his immediate attention which results in the meeting being put back and therefore that might be part of the explanation. However, it's clear that he's on time when he wants to be and therefore his tardiness and lack of punctuality isn't as a consequence of other events. Also, remember, it's likely that he's an individual that is the doer, not the done too, that he must assert the control and therefore would not let other events impact upon his availability, but rather deal with them by sending other people and enabling him then to get on with what he wants to do on time. The fact that he fails to turn up demonstrates a rampant sense of entitlement that he does what he wants when he chooses to do so at his own pace. It shows a lack of accountability. He shows no accountability to the individual that he's meeting with regard to their status. The fact that he's dealing with a politician who's of importance, a world leader. He shows no accountability to the person that he was on dates with in terms of ensuring that he was on time. He just engages in such a behaviour without any accountability. Indeed, punctuality is being seen by him as a shackle on his need for control. It demonstrates a lack of emotional empathy. He does not care how this inconveniences people, that they are stood waiting around, that they have other people to, to other things that they need to be doing. It is, of course, as I always said, that punctuality is the politeness of kings. And whilst Vladimir Putin regards himself as king of his own kingdom, he certainly does not extend that as a politeness to the people that he deals with. And this underpins a lack of emotional empathy. It demonstrates that his focus is elsewhere, and that he appears to be triangulating the waiting person with his absence, and could be seen as a form of a silent treatment, where he is asserting control over them by not yet turning up. When it comes to a failure to attend an event on time, the behaviours that I've just described are all applicable. However, what about the question of awareness and unawareness? A narcissist that's unaware will invariably be dealing with something else so that the person that they are due to be meeting has essentially fallen off their radar. So take, for example... A narcissist is meant to be meeting his girlfriend in the pub. She's in the sustained devaluation period. He is in the office, and he's chatting up one of the secretaries. At that point in time, his girlfriend is not on the radar. She does not It's as if she doesn't exist. And instead, he's chatting up Annie no knickers at his desk. She's in front of him, and, needs to ass and control must be asserted over her. The girlfriend who's waiting in the pub sends him a text message after ten minutes. Where are you? I'm waiting for you in the pub. She's now on the radar. His narcissism has to assert control over her, but also maintain control over Annie Nonickers, who might be a potential replacement for the girlfriend. And therefore, in the circumstances, his narcissism doesn't want him to immediately break off from talking to Annie Nonickers, but wants him to continue to assert control over her, but he must also assert control over the intimate partner primary sources in devaluation. So, what he then does is he sends her a text saying, just finishing up some important work, I'll be there shortly. She replies, okay. That demonstrates she's now under control and he can continue to talk to 
the individual he's flirting with as an intimate partner secondary source and not lose control of her. The girlfriend now has gone off the radar. He's not thinking about her. She doesn't exist. Until, 15 minutes later, still wondering where he is, she sends another text message. Where are you? I've been waiting 25 minutes. This is ridiculous. She comes up on the radar. He wants to maintain control of the secretary, but he also must nullify the threat to control posed by his girlfriend. Therefore, in the circumstance, sends another text message. Sorry, false contrition, had to take a call. I'm coming now. She replies, hurry up then, see you soon. She demonstrates that she's under control. His narcissism, because of his lack of accountability towards his girlfriend and sense of entitlement, still denotes that he can continue to talk to the secretary, notwithstanding the fact that he's been reminded twice that he's late for his meeting engagement with his girlfriend. He continues to talk, asserting control over the intimate partner secondary source, flirting with her, being suggestive, etc. And then another text comes in from the girlfriend. Where on earth are you? If you're not here in five minutes, I'm leaving. This level of threat to the sense of control means that there is a risk that he's going to completely lose control of the intimate partner primary source. And his narcissism then decides that he must then assert control in person. He replies, sorry, false contrition. Was trying to leave the office. Boss wanted to speak to me. I'm in the lift now. There comes no response from her, which suggests that she may not be under control, and therefore his narcissism will direct him to go and assert control in person to ensure that it is secured. At this juncture, the need to control the intimate partner primary source outweighs that of the intimate partner secondary source, added to which the narcissism dictates that he's had his fill of the intimate partner secondary source and she can be placed on the shelf. He thus leaves and attends. He's 40 minutes late. That lack of punctuality was as a consequence of him having, of course, a sense of entitlement, a lack of accountability, no emotional empathy for his girlfriend. But it also was a consequence of, as an unaware narcissist, he wasn't thinking about her. He wasn't thinking to himself, I'll teach her, I'll keep her waiting. It was quite simply the fact that he wasn't thinking about her because he was focused on something else. And then, when she came up on the radar, he had to respond to it. Once that was dealt with and the threat was nullified, he forgot about her again, in essence, and carried on talking. There was no conscious decision to keep her waiting. She was kept waiting because he was focused on something else. With an aware narcissist, they will deliberately keep the girlfriend waiting as part of teaching her a lesson, punishing her, and asserting control, and then using that time with somebody else. What is the case with Vladimir Putin. Is it the case that he's simply focused on other things and forgets about who he's meant to be meeting? Or is it a demonstrative and aware and deliberate and calculated assertion of control by purposely keeping that person waiting so that he asserts control over them whilst he can attend to other matters, exhibiting his sense of entitlement, lack of accountability, and lack of emotional empathy and manipulative behaviours? This will be revealed, of course, in our conclusion. There are certain further behaviours that have been reported on where, at the beginning of his presidency, Putin gained support for his tough response to a series of devastating bombings on apartment buildings in Russia reportedly by terrorists in Chechnya and Dagestan. However, there has been a long-running and somewhat credible rumour that the FSB, the successor agency to the KGB, engineered the bombings as a false flag to garner support for Putin and a new war in Chechnya. The aftermath of one bombing in 1999, more than a 1,000 people were injured and 293 people were killed in the bombings. Portin, for his part, has specifically denied any knowledge of a plot in his biography First Person, published in 2000. What? Blowing up our own apartment buildings. You know, that is really utter nonsense. It's totally insane. No one in the Russia Special Forces would be capable of such a crime against his own people issue of denial and that may well be correct but if that is the case that does tend to support a calculating cold absence of emotional empathy where human capital is disregarded and indeed is viewed as something that can be utilized in order to gain 
a greater gain at a later juncture and would support the suggestion, if accurate, of considerable planning. We, of course, will factor that into the ultimate outcome. Vanity is also a matter which raises itself with regard to Vladimir Putin. Vanity, of course, is a narcissistic trait, and it doesn't mean just because someone exhibits instances of vanity that they are a narcissist. Vanity can, of course, be held within a healthy, in a healthy way through empathic traits. But it is also an indicator, and whilst he's known for being famously frowning, the suggestion is recently that Vladimir Putin might find himself cut off from a supply of Botox because of sanctions imposed on Russia by global drug companies. In announcements that have been largely covered only by the business media, a series of drug makers, including Eli Lilly and Co., Novartis and Abvi Inc., are scaling back their operations in Russia as part of the sanctioning of the country for its invasion of Ukraine. Abvi, which owns the celebrated wrinkle treatment Botox, said it has temporarily suspended operations for all its aesthetics products in the country. Who, in Russia, might be affected particularly by that latest development? Perhaps Vladimir Putin himself, the man whose decision to invade Ukraine last month triggered an unprecedented array of sanctions from many Western nations. Is this accurate, or is this Western propaganda suggesting that he utilises Botox? The Daily Beast reminded its readers the 69-year-old Russian leader has long been reported to be a user of Botox, and he may be about to be cut off from his supply. A decade ago, a piece in the British newspaper The Guardian covered the rumours circulating on social media about the Russian leader's use of the product. A visit to Kiev in October 2011, when he was serving as Russia's Prime Minister, he showed up a meeting sporting a massive blue and yellow bruise around his eye, and bloggers across Russia decided it had to be the result of Botox injections. Such was the clamour, Mr. P Mr. Putin's spokesman was forced to issue denials. It's probably just how the light fell. The Prime Minister is tired, he said, which strikes me as a somewhat unconvincing explanation. It added that Russia's New Times magazine had covered the subject earlier in the year with an article headline, What Has Happened with Putin's Face? It is said that four poor plastic surgeons from the magazine that the, the magazine interviewed claimed the Russian leader had probably had cosmetic surgery and it was likely that he had undergone Botox injections in his forehead. If, of course, this is accurate, the fact that he's utilising this and at the age that he is suggests considerable vanity on his part. This concludes part three with more indicators that are starting to build up into a determinative picture of what he might be, ticking the boxes with regard to various criteria. In part four, we're going to look at another aspect of his personality with regard to the issue of greed and opulence. Join me there as we continue to examine Vladimir Putin. <laughs>